What's up, guys? I am Ashley Gavin, and I am your father. I'm Elena Joy. I am mommy. And I'm Mac Injimi, your hot teenage brother. <laughs> baby. Mac is baby. We are your chosen family, because you don't have a gay family, and you need a gay family. Every week, we bring a topic to the family dinner table, from gender dysphoria to monogamy to how to figure out if someone is into you. Listen to Chosen Family every Wednesday on your favorite podcast app, or watch full episodes on YouTube to get the full family experience. Chosen Family is a part of the Forever Dog podcast. Podcast Network. This episode may contain explicit language. Welcome to Mom and Dad Are Fighting, Slate's parenting podcast for Thursday, September 21st, the Toxic Achievement Edition. I'm Jamila Lemieux, a writer, contributor to Slate's Care and Feeding Parenting column, and mom to Naima, who's 10, and we live in Los Angeles. I'm Elizabeth Newcamp. I write the homeschool and family travel blog, Dutch Dutch Goose. I'm the mom of three littles, Henry, who's 11, Oliver, who's 9, and Teddy, who's 6. We live in Tokyo, Japan. I'm Zach Rosen. I make a different podcast. It's called The Best Advice Show. And I'm dad to Noah, who's 6, and Ami, who's 3. We live in Detroit. Today on the show, we're going to be joined by Jennifer Braheny wallace author of Never Enough, When Achievement Culture Becomes Toxic and What We Can Do About It. She'll tell us how to help our kids aim high, but also how to help them love themselves no matter what. But before that, we're going to share some stories from our week in parenting. And then, if you're in the Slate Plus Club, we'll be debriefing our interview with Jennifer and talking about our own experiences with achievement culture. Here's a peek of what you'll hear if you have Slate Plus. Jenny talked about like the this kind of false life vest that a lot of parents put on getting into a good college and that it's like actually a leaded vest. Like, what do you think is the kind of philosophical alternative to doing everything you can to get your kids into a good school? Like, what are your priorities? I mean, I think what I want is for them to find what makes them happy, right? Because I I know a lot of adults who pursued things for status, and they are unhappy now. What makes the kids happy? What is going to motivate them to want to get up and do their job? And that is in the back of my head. But I also feel like I am fighting a childhood where success was important. By becoming a Slate Plus member, you'll enjoy a weekly bonus segment and all your beloved Slate podcasts without any advertisements. It's the ultimate way to enhance your listening experience while also providing vital support to the show. You can join Slate Plus today by visiting slate.com slash mom and dad plus. All right, we're going to jump into triumphs and fails as soon as we get back from this short break. This is a weird segue, but have you ever bailed on a party, play date, whatever, because you're so bloated you'd have to wear sweatpants out? Well, Ritual created Symbiotic Plus with that weird gut stuff in mind. It contains clinically studied prebiotics, probiotics, and a postbiotic to support a balanced gut microbiome. I love that it has this pepperminty smell to it. It just feels like it's going to calm everything down. It's a daily three-in-one prebiotic, probiotic, and postbiotic with two of the world's most clinically studied probiotic strains to support the relief of mild and occasional bloating, gas, and diarrhea. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. There's no more shame in the gut game. That's why Ritual is offering mom and dad listeners 30% off during your first month. Visit ritual.com slash mom and dad to start Ritual or add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. We all want to set our kids up for success, and that means making sure they are receiving the best education. K-12 can help your child start reaching their full potential in life now with online education options tailored to their unique interests, needs, and schedules. K-12-powered schools are tuition-free, online-accredited public schools for kindergarten through 12th grade. K-12-powered schools have state-certified teachers trained in online education. Their online portal gives parents daily insights into curriculum and performance. K-12 can help your child gain skills, experience, and certifications all before graduating high school while giving you the support you need to get them there. K-12-powered schools have online education options for every type of student, and it could be perfect for your child. Help your child gain the skills they need to thrive in the future with K-12. There's still time to get started for the fall. Go to k12.com slash mom and dad today to learn more and find a tuition-free K-12-powered school near you. That's the letter K, the number 12, dot com slash mom and dad. K-12.com slash mom and dad. 
Zach, what have you been up to this week? Well, my little guy, he's not so little anymore. He turned three on Friday. Oh, happy birthday. Thank you. Ami is three years old. Noah's birthday is at the end of August. Shira's is at the beginning of September. And then Ami's is September 15th. So it's three Virgo. So it's like hardcore birthday season in our house. And for the last several weeks, Ami has known. Because last year at turning two, he didn't really know what his birthday was. This year he actually knows. And he's been saying, my birthday's coming up. My birthday's coming up. And he like knows how to hold up three fingers, um, which is no small feat. And so he's very excited. The eve of his birthday, um, I hear some coughing. I hear some sneezing. About 11 p.m. he starts throwing up. No. He wasn't like disappointed like oh i'm missing my birthday he just felt shitty so he stayed home from school he had a cozy day with daddy um we we did have a little bit of fun like he played for a little while but he mostly slept and watched pj masks and uh miraculously though he did feel like a lot better on saturday and then by sunday we had our family over actually at to to shear his parents house so my my sister and and parents um and she has siblings that we all came over and he was like back to himself and really, really happy to to celebrate. So it, it, it was uh, just like a 24 hour bug, which I, I thought that it might linger for longer. So he's doing great now and he is proudly in the three year old club. Aww, well, happy birthday. Sorry, he was sick. Thank you. <laughs> he's doing great now. Elizabeth, what about you? So we are slowly settling in. We got our stuff, but we went looking for a fencing club, which is something Oliver does and something he was very excited to continue. We moved all of his fencing gear here. We found a club that (laughs) speaks English and uh, took him. It's in the basement of this building. And in getting there, I like walked into an art gallery (laughs) first and then some kind of hotel. But eventually I find this fencing place in the middle of Tokyo. And I had brought um, Teddy with me. I left Henry at home just thinking like, well, he can stay home and there's just too much chaos surrounding trying to find things here. And we get there and there's like one other student in this class. So the fencing instructor says to Teddy, uh, do you want to fence? Like we have extra gear. You can give it a try. And Teddy, who has come to many of Oliver's lessons, probably most of them, I sort of was like, "Mm, he probably doesn't want to try. He's never expressed interest. He's like very into baseball and like your more kind of traditional sports was like, is there a sword for me? (laughs) And the guy's like, yeah. And he's like, I'm in. So he dressed out in the fencing stuff. He had the time of his life. Every time he would come back to sit on the bench, he was like, can I come do this every week? Can I come do this every week? So we have now signed up uh, two of the kids for fencing, which I just feel like is really great because now they can fence each other. And by the way, watching two of your children fence each other is... um, both terrifying and really exciting. Like they take out all their (laughs) aggression. Uh, Oliver is like very well trained, knows all the rules. And Teddy was just very excited to be given uh, a weapon. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But we, we have had to make the switch to, they did like a type of fencing called Epe in the States. And here they are teaching foil, which of course Oliver was like, I don't know the rules. Like it was this whole, Thing. But we got through it, and I guess now we have we have two fencers, and we're signed up. So I feel like that's another kind of cool. check mark and community, um, and it's kind of nice that the middle and little are going to do that together. Very cool. It strikes me that fencing, like it seems like for for the life you all live, like as global citizens, fencing f- seems like a really great kind of passport sport to participate in. I mean, it does seem like it's everywhere, and now that I have two fencers, all I really need is a coat. <laughs> So even if we move somewhere, I don't need a club anymore. Maybe that's going to be you. <laughs> I'm going to be the coach. <laughs> yeah. Get on YouTube. I did say I might have to actually learn the fencing rules now. I've kind of been coasting by, but... Um, Jamila, how's your week? All right. So I'm at the doctor's office, and I get a phone call from the school. And it's the principal. And she starts off like, hi, you know, I had the pleasure of meeting your daughter today. And I'm thinking, oh, Naima's is so cool. Uh-huh. Maybe she like said something smart in an uh-huh, assembly uh-huh. and really impressed the principal, you know, and she just wanted to call me and tell me. She goes on and says, I met Naima because she was involved in a food fight. Actually, she started a food fight. Oh, no. 
And I'm like, no way. First of all, I do not believe in food fights. Like, it's just, I've never seen one. Except on you TV. Know, this is something, I was going to say, except on TV. This is like The Simpsons, Nickelodeon. Right. This is not real right. life. We don't do right. this, you know? So Naima douses this boy with applesauce. Oh. She had a pouch of applesauce because he said, your mom's a stripper. Oh. I don't, Whoa. I don't even know what to react. The applesauce, the comment, I don't like. <laughs> and I forget what transpired between yeah, them why? before this to like lead to your mom's a stripper. But he says your mom's a stripper and Naima immediately reacts. You know, and so luckily the school is not very punitive and they believe in restorative justice. And so the kids who were involved, because it ended up being another boy, got involved trying yeah. to bend his friend and he got applesauce on him too. Like they ended up having to do a community service, pro- well, like a, a project on homelessness. Mm. And okay. they're going to have to, like, work on a food bank or something. And so that was the principal's, you know, method of restitution, which I thought was great and better than, like, suspending them or just taking away recess. Uh, well, they had to work on the project during recess. But anyway, um, when I picked Naima up, you know, I'm like, Naima, you can't do that. You know, you can't throw food at people. You can't put your hands on people, like... We don't get in other people's physical space. And she really couldn't understand why I was taking this stance. She's like, I defended you. You know, like Mm -hmm. he said something awful about you and I defended you. And so I said, what's so wrong with being a stripper? (laughs) Love that. You know? Uh Uh Um, Okay. And it leads to a very good talk about sex work. And, you know, it being work and maybe it's not work that we want to perform, but it's work and we shouldn't look down on people that participate in it and strippers sell a fantasy, you know, and that's okay for adults to indulge in. Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, I realized after, you know, I shared the story with a few people and everybody was immediately team Naima, go Naima, stand Mm. up for your mom. And I'm like, you know what? What she really needed to hear before anything was thank you for standing up for me. Mm. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know, like, thank you for being on my side. Yeah. yeah. And so I went back to her and I said, Naima, you know, I thought about how we talked about what happened the other day and I regret the way I brought it to you. You know, the first thing I should have said was that I really appreciate you standing up for me. And it means a lot to me that you go that hard for your mommy. Yeah. yeah. You know, it was just the way that you went about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh, incorrect. Uh-huh, uh-huh. What'd she say? Uh, she appreciated that. I think it made her feel a little better. Like the motivation was right. Yeah. Yeah. But the action. Next time, do it without the applesauce. This is one of your best stories yet, Jamila. Thank you. I've integrated it into my comedy. Yes. Uh, great. Look at you. The joke that I tell is somebody's saying I'm hot enough to be a stripper and my daughters are just hacking him. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, we're going to take another quick break. And when we get back, we'll be joined by Jennifer Brahani Wallace. What's up, guys? I am Ashley Gavin, and I am your father. I'm Elena Joy. I am mommy. And I'm Mac Injury, your hot teenage brother. <laughs> baby. Mac is baby. We are your chosen family, because you don't have a gay family, and you need a gay family. Every week, we bring a topic to the family dinner table, from gender dysphoria to monogamy to how to figure out if someone is into you. Listen to Chosen Family every Wednesday on your favorite podcast app, or watch full episodes on YouTube to get the full family experience. Chosen Family is a part of the Forever Dog podcast. Podcast Network. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now. We're back. We're now joined by Jennifer Brahani Wallace. 
She's a reporter and author, and her latest book, Never Enough, has been getting a lot of attention because it's hard to know when to push your kids to achieve more and when to dial it back. Luckily, Jenny interviewed experts and surveyed over 6,000 parents for Never Enough, so she knows what toxic achievement culture looks like and how to stop it. We're excited to draw on her expertise here. Jenny, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. 6,000 parents? Over Talk 6, about achievement, parents. Jenny. What? I, d- I tend to over-report. I, I have that reputation. I had it at 60 Minutes, and then I had it, yeah, I over-report. <laughs> What inspired you to start looking into achievement culture? So in 2019, when I was writing the proposal for this book, three things were happening. One was my oldest was in eighth grade and about to enter high school. And it struck me that I had four years left to, you know, put all of the information and coping skills and everything he might need to be able to survive when he leaves us and thrive. Um, And then at the same time, the Varsity Blue scandal hit. If you remember, oh, yeah. it was parents from the East Coast and the West Coast that got caught up in an illegal bribery scheme to get their kids into highly selective colleges. And I wasn't buying the narrative that these parents just wanted logos. I felt like there was something deeper. Their their desperation felt familiar. Um, and I, I wanted to get to the roots of it. And then finally, the last thing that happened was in 2019, I wrote an article for the Washington Post about how students attending what researchers call high-achieving schools, those are public and private schools around the country where the kids go off to selective four-year colleges, those kids were now officially at risk, meaning they were two to six times more likely to suffer from clinical levels of anxiety, depression, and two to three times more likely to suffer from substance abuse disorder than the average American teen. And my kids were going to these schools. And so I wanted to know, what could I do in my home to buffer against the excessive pressure? Yeah, I'm curious, like, take us inside your home. And especially, I don't know you, Jenny, but I know that you've interviewed 6,000 people. I know that you went to Harvard. You are like a very accomplished person. Can you describe the moments where you had to like stop yourself from like being the high achieving you know, driving person and like being the mom you wanted to be? Like, what what was happening? I will say that that growing up, achievement was important, but it did not define me uh, and it did not did not define my childhood, which is why I think I was a healthy mm-hmm. striver. But yeah, writing this book, I would often, which is titled Never Enough, I would often say to myself, oh my God, it's mm. never enough. I need to <laughs> mm-hmm. another family. And I, And so um, what I did, I'll tell you how I was able to be the parent I wanted to be, the wife and the friend I wanted to be, was I I really have to say I credit my best friend, Katie Spikes, who passed away a couple of months ago, who was my best friend of 30 years. And when I felt like I needed to do more and more and more, it was calling her and saying, here's what I'm going through. And she would ground me. And it's a lot of the advice that I give in the book is grounded in relationships that ground us. It's our relationships that show us that we are, that we have value. Um, It gives us kind of that social proof. And so Katie was very much my touchstone. Yeah. So like, what does that grounding look like in the moment? It looks like she and I had a once a week phone call with our mutual friend, Tira, for an hour a week. And we would, all through the pandemic, this started because I, in in researching this book, I found the number one intervention for any child in distress was to make sure the primary caregivers, the adults in that child's life, felt supported, and um, you know their mental health was intact. And so I found that research very early, and I knew I have had long term relationships. I'm so grateful for my friendships, but I knew I wasn't always as intentional as I needed to be. And so for four years of writing this book, I had a once a week, one hour Zoom minimum with my friends where we would come to the table, share our vulnerabilities, talk about our, you know, self-doubts and all of that and really lean on each other. So that's what it looked like, practically speaking. And then how did it look in my office? I would say to myself, this was a line I learned from a perfectionism researcher that I interviewed. Uh, he would say to himself, well, that's enough for Mm. the day. Mm. And I literally signal myself at the end of the day, 
Well, that's enough for the day. Because when you're writing a book, you could be doing 24-hour cycles and it would never feel like enough. So really having those limits in place and having the mindset and having friends to ground you, that was so necessary. Well, let's talk a little bit about why we're pushing our kids so hard. One of the reasons is that we want them to have a life with all these societal markers, a degree, a job, a house, a family. Life is growing more expensive. How are those stressors influencing parents in relation to achievement culture? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that. So when you think back to when I was growing up in the 70s and early 80s, life was generally more affordable. Housing was more affordable, higher education, real estate, food, everyday items were more affordable. There was what I call slack in the system. And so parents could be more relaxed when it came to achievement because they generally believed that even with some missteps, that their children would likely be able to replicate their childhoods, if not do even better. That's the American dream, right? To do just as well or better than your parents. But what modern parents are seeing today is the first generation millennials that are not doing as well as their parents. Um, You know, they're saddled with debt. They can't afford the real estate. And their parents are absorbing these macroeconomic forces. And in the words of researchers, becoming social conduits passing these fears and anxieties about the uncertain future onto their kids. Parents are not doing this to harm their children. It's always been the job of a parent to prepare a kid for the future. But this future feels very unknown. We don't know what the jobs are going to be. Now AI is on the scene. I mean, we don't know what we're preparing our kids for. And so a lot of parents, particularly parents in the upper middle class, are betting big that childhood success that getting their kid into a quote unquote good college will act as a kind of life vest, keeping them afloat in a sea of uncertainty. But what we're seeing and what I found in my research is that that life vest is really acting more like a leaded vest and drowning too many of the kids that we're really trying to protect. So how do you get that balance between encouraging your children to strive for success and also like fostering resilience and well-being? And I feel like I personally struggle with this like I you want to encourage them right and you you also children need they need a little bit of like you can do this and we can work harder and I do want you to learn these new things but also as we become aware of these things giving them this lead vest right so how how do we find that balance yeah well I think I you know I I sort of lay it out in the book um, how parents need to be the balance keeper of their kids lives So what does that look like in action? Um, Instead of, for example, instead of focusing on shiny outcomes, like I want to see an A in math on your report card, which by the way, our kids could get by cheating. um, You know, instead of that, it is really scaffolding them at home. It's showing them how work gets done in your house. And I really took that advice to heart. A psychologist that I interviewed talked about that, that in our home, you know, we I, I taught my kids from when homework really became in middle school when it really started charging up. Um, I would say, here's how we do work, work in our house. We come home, we have a short break, then we sit at our desk. We don't have our iPhones or our, you know, social media or whatever on our desks. We have a charging in another room mm-hmm. so that we could get really focused for 20 or 30 minutes and then take a break. So what I what I focus on at home are sort of healthy work hygiene. What the research finds is that if your kids know how to do the work, the grades will come. And then if the grades don't come, Jenny, which they don't, I mean, they didn't come for me. Like, you know, how how do we parent to kids who aren't good at school um, in the traditional sense? So I would start by getting curious, not furious. So I think we all have to understand that kids want to be successful. Um, They want to do well. And they want to make you proud. And they already know that that you want them to be successful. So if they're not performing, you know, getting curious means perhaps getting them tested for a learning difference, seeing how they're getting their work done. Also assessing, is it the relationship with their teacher? Are they having trouble with their peers? So getting curious, there are a lot of things that can be going on that can get in the way of our children's achievement. And it's also you know, our kids feel like we love them and value them. When we do have standards, when we have standards about how work gets done, 
but it's a bar that needs to be adjusted for each child and depending on where each child is developmentally. So, you know, unfortunately, in our society today, we don't take into account late bloomers. And I will tell you right now, I was a late bloomer, you know, and I've noticed this in my own family that there's just some things that take a little longer for my kids and they hit their stride really sophomore year of high school, which is when I hit my stride. So, you know, we have this bar as a society of what success looks like. And and just to mix metaphors, the path is really narrow and it doesn't suit all kids. So I think another way to encourage success of our kids is to really get a PhD in them. And that means not what society says is the strength you need to have, but really getting to know them as individuals. What is it? What are those strengths that they that they naturally come by? And then help them use those strengths to overcome weaknesses. And that can be really hard. It was very hard for me as a parent to be able to like untangle my kids' strengths from just who they were. And so there's this survey that's free online called the VIA survey, V-I-A survey, that was um, developed by Marty Seligman and Christopher Peterson, two of the grandfathers, really founders of positive psychology. And there's a survey for adults and there's a survey for kids. And four years ago, when I started this research, we did it as a family. And you can print out what your top five strengths are. And I remember my daughter, her top strength was humor. And so when there was drama on the seventh grade lunch table, I would say to her, where could you, what, which of these strengths could you use to help you with this? And she was like, oh, humor. I could use humor. When the drama's breaking out, I could be sarcastic. So there was something that gave my kids power in knowing what their strengths were. And my job as a parent was to be the guide and to help them match those strengths to you know places in the world that they can make an impact or how they can use them to overcome weaknesses. How can parents initiate meaningful conversations with their kids about values and priorities? Because when you're the kid who's struggling with math, it's hard to, you don't assume that your parents are going to be okay with you getting a C if a C is the best you can do. Your assumption is that I've failed somehow. I'm not performing up to standard. You know, what's wrong with me? As a parent, I think it is our job to, as much as we can, make our homes a haven from the pressure. You know, our kids are getting pressure about grades and extracurricular activities from their peers. They're getting it from their peers' parents through osmosis. You know, they're feeling it in the classroom. They're feeling it in the wider culture. They're seeing it on social media. And so at home, I think home, if there's, well, there are a few takeaways in the book, but a big one is home needs to be a haven from that pressure. It is not like it was when we were growing up. The pressures are everywhere. And so let home be a place where they can recover. If a C is truly the best they can do, focus on things outside of the C. You know, I, I th- that's all I could say is as a parent, to make our homes a place where our kids never question their value to us, that it's never contingent on their performance. I did a survey Um, with the help of a researcher at Baylor, of 500 young adults, ages 18 to 30. Most of the students were in college, 18 to 22. And I asked them, if you don't mind, I'd love to read a couple of things that that they told me. Because as a parent, some of this was hard to read. Um, So I asked them uh, how much they felt like they mattered to their parents. And what I found in the survey was that 70% of them reported that they thought their parents valued and appreciated them more when they were successful at school. 50% said that they thought their parents loved them more when they were successful at school, with 25% of the students saying they believed this a lot, meaning that one in four of the students in the survey said that they thought their parents loved them more when they were successful than when they weren't. That's a problem. That's a problem that our kids feel like our love is conditional. That's a problem not just in adolescence when they are developing a sense of self. That is a problem that can haunt them throughout their life. I mean, I got to say, this is... 
this is one of my primary, I don't want to call it a failure, but challenges as a as an adult is tying my own specifically professional success to my self-worth. Like I'm kind of obsessed with it um, despite being aware of it. So it's like, you know, I'm, I'm very much trying to untangle that thing. And it, it gives me a, a bit of anxiety just to consider my kids watching me have that struggle. But like, what's, what do you do at home to, you know, untangle your own self-worth from your success and in turn your, your kids? That is such a good question. So when I was uh, about 10 years ago, I was writing an article for the Wall Street Journal about perfectionism. And the reason I was writing it was because my daughter was showing signs of perfectionism. And I was like, wow, okay, I got to nip this in the bud. She's young. And then I read that the pathway for children in developing perfectionism is parents, and in particular mothers, according to the research. And so I needed to get my own perfectionism in check. And when you're when you have perfectionistic tendencies, which I think a lot of high achievers do, it takes a lot to dial it down, but you can dial it down. And the way I have dialed it down is by looking at how I spend my time. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I am a high achiever. I get a lot of joy from my achievements. Um, but I also get a, a joy from being a friend, from having a good marriage, from being close with my kids. Uh, from travel. And so if I wanted to enjoy all of those domains in my life, you can't do that if you are fully gunning it. And Mm -hmm. so what it takes is clarity around the domains in your life and the idea that you are willing to be good enough in some of them. And, um, you know, it's really hard to excel in more than one or two domains. So, and I've said no to a lot of career things, a lot of career opportunities for that reason. And every day is not balanced and every week isn't balanced, but it's a conscious effort and I've started to model it. So when, okay, so I'll give you an example. So the first article I wrote for the Washington Post science section, the draft came back with red marks everywhere. It was kind of humiliating as a professional writer. And so at the same time, my daughter was working on a writing assignment and she got red marks everywhere. And so I marched her over to my desk and I said, look, even professional writers need edits and help. I said, you know, I was embarrassed when I got it. But then I said to myself, wow, this editor is really investing in me. So helping my child. So what Mm. perfectionism does is it's extremes, right? It's I'm good at my job or I'm awful at my job. So helping our kids um, understand how we think through problems, right? I could have said, I could have one not shown her it and only shown my perfect side, right? But I have adopted the idea of living my life out loud with my kids. And I let them see me stumble and I let them see me, you know, whatever it is. Um, And uh, so that's Mm -hmm. one way. Another way is, as we talked about earlier, it's having friends in your life who know you and love you and value you that you can be vulnerable with and that they can reassure you that you are loved no matter what. The perfectionist believes that they are not lovable unless they are perfect. And I'm here to tell you that's just not true. Jenny, thank you so much for joining us. Never Enough, When Achievement Culture Becomes Toxic and What We Can Do About It is out now. Where else can people find you, Jenny? You can get me at my website, jenniferbwallace.com or follow me on Instagram at Jennifer Brahenny Wallace. Thank you guys so much for having me on and for this conversation. And that's our show. Please subscribe, leave a rating and review and tell your friends. If you have a question for us or a topic you want us to address, email us at slate.com. This episode of Mom and Dad are Fighting is produced by Rosemary Belson and Mara Curry. Shasha Leonard is the voice of our listeners. Alicia Montgomery is VP of Slate Audio. For Zach Rosen and Elizabeth Newcamp, I'm Jamila Lemieux. Thank you for listening. 
What's up, guys? I am Ashley Gavin, and I am your father. I'm Elena Joy. I am mommy. And I'm Mac <laughs> Injury, your hot teenage brother. <laughs> baby. Mac is baby. We are your chosen family, because you don't have a gay family, and you need a gay family. Every week, we bring a topic to the family dinner table, from gender dysphoria to monogamy to how to figure out if someone is into you. Listen to Chosen Family every Wednesday on your favorite podcast app, or watch full episodes on YouTube to get the full family experience. Chosen Family is a part of the Forever Dog Podcast Network.